Well, good morning or, or good afternoon or good evening, depending on what part of the world you're tuning in from. Um, Larry Wilson here with Kara Moore. She is the CEO of ProNappers Limited. Kara, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today and, and to talk about napping and the, the power of napping. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, napping is my superpower, and I just want to champion it and share it with your listeners. Well, the, you, you know, I got introduced to Kara by uh, David Hughes. David Hughes is a business development manager for Safe Start International for uh, the, the UK and the Scandinavian countries. Um, but, but he's been with us for a long time. And he introduced me to Kara, but right in his email, he was stating that he had started napping and that it was helping him. And from, from my personal point of view, uh, you know, hearing a testimonial from somebody is one thing. Hearing somebody say, I'm now doing it or it made me change. And then actually talking a bit about the, uh, you know, the, the benefits um, got me very interested, Kara. But as I've said to you before, um, very skeptical about any of these kinds of things with uh, the North American uh, sort of workforce so maybe just so that we could kind of set a few cards on the table right off the bat why don't you just tell us a bit about some of the you know the benefits of napping as it would relate to key performance indicators at a company like recordable injuries reduction in musculoskeletal injuries uh, reduction in, you know, even shipping errors, accounting errors. Um, give give us some hard numbers, Kara, to start off with, because I'm I'm not the the only North American skeptic, and it's not so much we're it's word that we could get it implemented here and actually make it work. And I'll, I'll tell you guys all some stories later about some stretching programs I've seen and things like that. But um, give us some. Uh, you know, if you will, uh, you know, show us some money, show us some money kind of thing, Kara. Sure. Um, where to start? I think mean, sleep or lack of sleep underpins performance, it underpins uh, decision making, it underpins safety. And I'm just going to roll off a few, ben some of the benefits that I'm sure many of your listeners, if they um, ever have a nap at home, will absolutely be able to relate to. So if you have an unplug in the day and have a 10 or 20 minute nap, afterwards you will feel more alert. You will um, be able to focus better on the tasks you're doing that afternoon. You will be able to concentrate better. You will be able to make better decisions. You will be more accurate and you will work faster, okay? You, if you're comparing um, documents, you'll be able to make um, connections. And not only do you um, work faster, when you've had a nap, you're not gonna be rushing, okay? So you're gonna have less errors due to... Um, there's, due to there's, a key word, there's a key word she figures I've got a twig on right there, mm -hmm. eh? Like, you know, you won't be rushing. He's gotta jump on that, right, come on. He is the safe start guy. Um, what about endurance too, Kara? In other words, your 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 ability to concentrate, but for much longer, I would think, would also be enhanced. Well, the pervasive um, paradigm is to power through, okay? Right. And that is ineffective, all right? Because we, we are not machines. We can't just plug in and keep going at the same rate all day long. The best thing that you can do, and these are the words of um, David Hughes, in fact, is you need to power down, not power through. So when you feel um, weary, when you feel tired, when you feel that you're not working at your best, when you've got that um, foggy head, the very best thing you can do is have a nap. And as well as those performance um, things that we've talked about, 
When you've had a nap, you're going to feel less frustrated. You're going to listen better. Your mood's going to be elevated. You're going to have better relationships. You're generally going to be nicer to people. Um, so there are so many um, kind of human um, relationship benefits. And the other benefit is that if you are somebody who struggles to sleep at night, having a nap in the day will help you sleep better at night. So the World Sleep Society has published the top 10 tips for a good night's sleep. And their number two tip is to have a nap in the day. Well, what, you've got to tell us the number one, but uh, let me let me come back to that though, because I think that one point right there might be uh, very commonly missed, um, well, like a 180. In other words, I, I have on planes, like especially because of the time zones and things, purposely forced myself to stay awake and not nap on the plane mm -hmm. because I was like, I don't have enough data to say I've got, you know, uh, st like just it seemed to me that I couldn't sleep mm -hmm. that night. And I was always saying that's because you, you know, you slept for that hour on the plane, but then maybe that's because I slept for an hour and not 20 minutes. And mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of those questions too, kind of matter of fact, Kara, that I got to make sure I remember, you know, how long, how many a day, all, sure. all the rest of that. But mm -hmm. if you could just for a second back to some of the, you know, some of the places you've worked with or what you know in terms of general industry statistics, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm aware from my wife, certainly when she worked the 12 hour shifts at the hospital, mm -hmm. that they would, it was, it wasn't, official mm -hmm. but if there was an empty room like this was pre-covid obviously everybody but if there was an empty room they could go and nap for an hour between three and four o'clock in the morning and it wasn't encouraged or discouraged it was just sort of a, a practice that happened mm -hmm. um but it wasn't it, it wasn't technically supported by the company if you will yeah it, it was that's very commonplace, Larry. And so these these hard this hard data that you're asking me for is difficult to come by. There is data that comes out of controlled research. So, for example, NASA did a study, and that's what um, has has polarized the thinking that the ultimate time for a power nap is around 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. okay. A specific study. Most of the evidence that a nap works in the day is subjective it's from people saying the difference that it makes to them and it's from looking at what happens when we are weary so that fatigue risk and because it is so topical i just would love to share with you and with your listeners that we had an industrial accident in the uk back in november 22nd 2016 a a rush hour commuter tram sped up into a corner and derailed, overturned, seven died and 50 were injured. And the reason I'm mentioning it today is that the jury have just ruled that the reason for that was the, the cause of death was accidental death. And I'm just going to read um, what they said. The foreman of the jury said that the tram driver had become disorientated, which had caused loss of awareness in his surroundings, probably due to a lack of sleep, as a result of which he failed to break in time. And so it, it's those things. It's it's, And there are other um, big, well-known disasters, the Exxon oil spill, even Chernobyl, where it's related back to fatigue. Now, I'm not saying if those people had had a nap, the disasters would have been averted. I, you know, I can't prove that. But all I know is that people who regularly nap as part of their resilience and performance strategy will tell you that after even 10 or 20 minutes, they feel as effective and on it as they did at the beginning of the day when they had just woken up. Okay, okay. So 
in terms of a handy study that somebody could say, you know, here was something done by, you know, RASPA or uh, IOSH in the UK or something mm -hmm. that says this company implemented a napping strategy and reduced their uh, their injuries or their shipping errors by 50%. There, there have it, it hasn't gone that far in terms of sort of technical, technical data. It's been, it's been mostly sort of personal anecdotal and is, would it be fair to say, Kara, in terms of general industry that it's been um, kind of like my wife at the hospital. In other words, there's been an acknowledgement that it's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. They've seen some people, you know, napping in their chair during break, or maybe, you know, there's sort of a place that people tend to go where it's dark and quiet at three or four in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, if you're operating the refinery, but None of it is official, or is it? Is that is that is that changing, um, or is industry becoming more receptive? Are they actually moving from receptive to supportive? Um, they are because the people are talking, and the pandemic has helped with this. Because whilst people were working from home, one of the things that's coming through is that the thing that they put into their workday was a nap. And when they go back to the office, they don't want to lose um, the ability to do that. Okay, okay. All right, well, just, be, just before I forget altogether then, you said napping was the number two thing on the list for a, be, a good night's sleep. What was the number one? I'm going to have to look that up in a quiet moment and tell you. <laughs> okay. I can, easily, I can find, the, um, find the image. Don't have a big cup of coffee right before going to sleep is number Absolutely. one. I don't know. Um, okay, well, Karen, tell us a bit about if, um, well, maybe just a bit about how a company would get started with this um, and maybe just a bit about what what you folks do to you know, enable all of this or, you know, the the, the process that you recommend or that you go through with the company. I mean, I, I, one of the things I've got to tell everybody before uh, we go too much further that Kara, I guess what really hooked me was she said, you should really start with the people who need to nap, Larry. I mean, there some people can get by without it, but there's some people who really can't. They don't function well at all. And so at least accommodating those people. And to me, that made perfect sense, Kara, just like you would like I've said to you before, just like you'd accommodate a diabetic. I mean, you'd, you know, you'd make sure they could eat when they needed to eat. They could take their insulin when they needed to take it. And you wouldn't be considered some sort of great benevolent employer just because you put a sharps container in the men's room and the ladies room. That would just be normal business practice. So what about for the people who have a need, right? They need to nap. Should you at least, you know, and, and I also thought that made a very difficult to argue with an edge of the wedge, if you will, to get in with. But take take it from the take it from the top, Kara. You know, if I was if I phoned you up and said, Hey, you know, I think uh, you know, I, I think we could probably do do well if we learned a bit more about this or implemented this at the company. We're having a lot of fatigue related problems. Mm -hmm. How would you uh, take it away? Like I said, show, okay. show me. So talking about the people who want to nap in the day, who need to nap, that's the way we would go in by saying that make having a place to nap and a culture that makes it acceptable to nap should be part of any company's progressive and inclusive well-being provision. Okay, so not everybody wants to recharge in the middle of the day by going for a run or doing some yoga. Some people know that the very best thing that they can do is shut their eyes. And we can talk about that, you know, that you don't actually have to go to sleep, um, but they shut their eyes. And that is the thing that they need to do to perform at their best and to, to be safe. And 
what I suggest I do now, Larry, if this is a good moment for you, is if I shared my screen, I could just take um, your viewers tonight through um, a dozen uh, very colorful slides. And then if people are listening in, um, I'll be talking through the slides so they will get the benefit of what I'd love to share. Sure, Kara, but just before, tell us just, just for a second or two, yeah. anyhow, how did you get into all of this? Like, okay. Were you, were you just like falling, falling, one of those falling asleep on the subway mm -hmm. people like and realize, oh my goodness, or did you um, like, you know, there, I know there's people with sleep apnea that's, you know, a, a maybe more serious sort of sort of thing. We don't necessarily want to get into that. But I mean, how did you, what got you into all this? So what got me into it was my personal experience and then, and then timing. So I have always been a lark, an early riser, and I am one of those um, people that just in the early afternoon, I need to switch off. And this became particularly evident when I was a working mum with young children. And I'm not gonna put my maternal um, mothering skills on the line here, but my eldest son didn't sleep through the night till he was nearly four. And being able to nap and giving myself that permission to nap was what got me through. And when my children got older and started sleeping through the night and even became teenagers and then I couldn't get up, you know, couldn't get them up in the morning, um, yeah, I was still that lark. And my go-to resilience thing was to have a nap. And what happened was two years ago, um, a, a very um, highly respected researcher, um, Dr. Matthew Walker, brought out a book called Why We Sleep. And I'm sure your listeners will have come across it. And Matthew Walker was really bringing the importance of sleep into the workplace. And what I noticed was that companies were only were embracing this alongside promoting good nutrition and good physical exercise, but they were talking to their, um, their employees about how to get a good night's sleep. So good sleep hygiene. And I thought, but that is only half the story. And eight out of 10 of us do not sleep well at night, despite the best, our best intentions of having um, good sleep hygiene. And Matthew Walker in his book said that allowing your people to nap was the biggest form of a physiological injection of venture capital that any organization could make. And so when I read that, I thought, okay, I need to start um, evangelizing about naps and get on my soapbox and talk to people and talk to companies about it because I think it could be transformational if napping was normalized in the workplace. So a couple of years ago, I got together with um, some well -being, a well-being consultant and behavioral change expert, and we put together our company ProNappers, and we now go into companies and we educate and we inspire and we consult on places to nap, where, where to nap, um, we educate on how to nap, we talk about how to shift the stigma, and that that, that is our business. Um, okay. Basically normalizing napping in the workday based on my own personal experience, but also the experts bringing sleep mainstream into the work day and work performance and work safety conversation. Well, I mean, it, make, it makes sense, but I mean, I, you, when you were telling me about the CEOs you work with who have to go like sneak down to the parking garage and nap in their car in secret because it, it wrecks their fearless leader, you know, man of steel image that you know you need to go for a little nappy in the afternoon do you have your blankie with you you know i mean like that you know when you told me that these guys are actually like sneaking down to the car in the parkade to nap i'm going well yeah. that's pretty real though like i mean yeah. that's you know that you're not doing all of that day in and day out mm -hmm. without questioning it and you know, considering the alternatives. So 
there is a fair bit of stigma to overcome, I would also imagine, that you folks encounter. Um, that there is stigma, and what we, there are a couple of things about those CEOs. I, I think one of the reasons they aspire for the corner office, not having to work open plan, is so that they have a place where they can nap behind <laughs> closed doors. And the another interesting anecdote is that if you, I'm sure for many of your listeners, if they talk, if they ask their, think about their fathers, who may well have um, worked at a time when they went home for lunch from the office, though they will probably be able to say that their fa they saw their fathers um, nap after lunch before they went back to work. So it's it's um, modern day practices have squeezed out that unnatural urge to nap. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, the and has I mean there there were whole cultures obviously in Latin America the siesta and so on after lunch, but I'm well from what I've been told anyhow I haven't been traveling for a while, but you know, sort of less and less of that as they become kind of more and more and more uh, industrialized and so on. Um, so, you know, you want, maybe that's a step in the wrong direction. In other words, they, they had it right at the beginning. Um, and now, you know, thinking, well, we're not, you know, we're not productive enough, but the reality is you become more productive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Carrie, take... Uh, I think I think you know take it take it away and kind of show us uh, if you can a bit of a, a bit of how a company could go about uh, you know I implementing this and getting the and getting the benefits and getting the benefits of napping and I'll I'll try to just chime in here and there with a couple of qualifying questions if I can think of any but uh, take it away. Okay, so I will do that now. Okay. You're right with you folks. Okay. So what I'm going to do is talk you through um, some of the points that we would start to talk to companies about because we start with that, that education piece and inspiring people. So, and some of this we've already ready touched on um, Larry. So the first thing is that for, for many, a good night's sleep is just a dream, okay? There are so many things outside our control that can cause you not to have a good night's sleep. And it can be everything from a partner who snores, um, needing to get up in the night to go to the loo, being a carer for a newborn baby, um, the after effects of a good night out or not even a good night out, a good night in, human nature is that we we drink wine and beer and the, the after effects of that is we don't sleep so well um it's commonplace now that people uh, binge on their um sort of netflix things and they they're on their social media till late at night and all that can impact um a good night's sleep not to mention um a, a racing mind and an anxiety which has escalated during the pandemic that can just play havoc with getting a, new, a good night's sleep. And then the other thing is working across time zones. So in the UK, we'd be getting up early to talk to Asia. We'd be working um, into the evenings to talk to you folks um, in Canada and the States. And I know just as a very real example, um, my son who's 25, he works for an American company. He's working till 10 o'clock um, with clients. Uh, Monday through Thursday, but he's also starting early because he's in the in the UK. And when it's time for lunch and he takes a break, he spends 10 or 20 minutes having a nap. So when you're working across time zones, you know, as I said this before, we're not designed to just power through without a break. And for having a nap is, is a really good idea. So we start with 
you know, many, many people do not get enough sleep. And in fact, the statistic, as I said, was that four out of five of us don't get the eight hours sleep we need at night. And I have got some hard stats for you here. Um, the cost of sleep deprivation in the US is 2.3% of GDP, $411 billion. And the cost in the UK is 1.9% of GDP, which is $50 billion. And 36% um, of working professionals get less than six hours sleep per night. And this uh, research was done by RAND. So the effect on productivity of not enough sleep can be seen in hard financial numbers. And we talked a, a, earlier about the benefits of having a nap, but I think it's really worthwhile looking at the risks of fatigue at work of fatigue at work because if you have three consecutive nights of less than six hours sleep it has the same effect of being intoxicated and we do not expect people to or think it's acceptable for people to work when they're drunk so I'm just going to read through this um, list for those of people who are listening in so when you're tired you're less alert tasks take longer you make mistakes your concentration is shorter, your comprehension, your understanding is slower, your uh, ability to listen is reduced and your ability to learn and take in information is reduced. And we have poorer memory formation. Then there's the relationship piece. We have inappropriate mood and responses, reckless risk-taking, and of course, um, dangerous driving and other uh, safety issues in the workplace. Yeah, I remember seeing a study, Kara, from Australia that was, uh, if you'd been up for 17 hours, it was the equivalent of a blood alcohol content of 0.05, which mm -hmm. at the time was the legal limit in Australia. Most places at that time in the world were 0.08. And then um, if you'd been up for 24 hours, mm -hmm. it was the equivalent of 0.17. Mm. Now, point, point 0.17. Um, you, you're, you're not blowing bubbles, but you're you're wobbly, and uh, um, you know to drive a fork truck uh, on a double shift was not considered all that risky from a company's perspective. But certainly, somebody driving a forklift at point 0.17 would be a fireable offense anywhere. Mm. So, um, I, and the, the reflex, you know, anything that's moment to moment risk where you need your reflexes mm. to get tired, those become slower and rarely is a reflex or whether you got the benefit of your reflexes ever part of an investigation. So it wouldn't be great or easy to get hard numbers for that unless you are willing to move over into athletics where you know, in hockey, it's common practice, you know, fatigue kills skills. If you're tired, get off the ice. You know, that that's part of the whole hockey shift rotation yeah. thing is you can't, you're no good when you're tired. So you wouldn't think this would be a hard sell per se, but I bet you I'm totally wrong on that. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's up it's up for you guys all the way, I, I, I imagine. But the, be the best ideas often need ramming down people's throats. And you're right. There's a lot that we can learn from um, sports. And uh, um, many sports uh, are now working with um, sleep experts who are helping the athletes, not just with their night sleep, but also their recovery sleeps during the day. And if we've got any... Um, fans out there who followed the English um, football way back when Man United won the treble, it was attributed to the fact that they had introduced napping into their performance program. And naps are a big part of the success that's being enjoyed by the British cycling team. So let me just keep going with this. Um, yeah. what, one of the problems is not just that it's not the stigma, but it's also the individual denying that they are tired. 
and powering through, thinking that they just need to keep going, get to the end of their task list and ignoring the signs. And the signs that you um, are, are, are weary and should stop and unplug and rest and nap are, are physical signs, cognitive signs and emotional signs. So just to give you a, a couple of examples um, from each of these um, buckets, physical sensations could be that you have, um, that you feel sluggish and that your head has that kind of low dull ache um, and your eyes might feel sort of bleary and um, irritated. And uh, I think you said as well, that piece about dexterity, you know, you're, le you're less able to do say the fine maneuver in the forklift truck. And then examples from the cognitive um, bucket of tests that you can um, apply to yourself. One might be um, that you're aware that you are less able to fully consider and analyze your decisions. And a second one is around judgment. Um, you know, you know you're making mistakes and you're missing things. And then the third uh, bucket of tests is emotional tests. So recognizing in yourself that you're feeling irritated and uptight and tense, um, or looking, thinking about your motivation, feeling, knowing that you're less interested in um, getting on with your, your tasks. So there are so many signs, and we call this test the subjective um, fatigue test. And it's one that's also used within the army. And in fact, the army are, and I've read this in the US as well as the UK, they are great um, champions of the, the power nap. Um, so it's not just sport, it's the army as well. And I think the, the message that we really want to get across to people is it's naps are not just for when you've had a bad night's sleep. Napping is actually normal. We are naturally biphasic sleepers. We are like many, many other mammals in the animal kingdom. We are designed to sleep during the day. And there have been scientific studies um, about this. So napping is normal. It's, it's not something that is a, um, you know, a, a slight or a, a, a negative on your character or your personality. It is a normal thing to, um, in the middle of the day, our circadian rhythm means that our need to sleep and our urge to sleep do have a peak and our bodies are actually telling us, I need to sleep. But what modern day has done is said, okay, but don't sleep, just go and have another fizzy drink or another cup of coffee. Or in the past, it would be just go outside and have a cigarette. There were unhealthy um, interventions that could mask um, or, or take the place of, of having a nap, but are not nearly as effective. And what we like to say is, because it's a really simple analogy, is to think of a nap as a sleep snack, okay? So during the day, we don't all have the luxury of eating our kind of three plates of balanced food and rainbow nutrients. And real life means that we are eating on the go and we need to reach for snacks, hopefully healthy snacks. Well, modern day and sleep is the same. It's it's no longer do we have life where the work day ends at 5 p.m. and we go home and we chill out and then we get a really good night's sleep and then go to work restored in the morning. That's not real life. Um, so having a nap in the day, you can think of it as a healthy sleep snack. Um, okay. Nap, if you nap during the day like the athletes, does that help your body to release more growth hormone or does your body still release the same amount? I mean, there, there is that circadian, like I know that pro bodybuilders um, and a lot of athletes need that nap or sleep in the afternoon because that's when your body recovers, right, is when you're sleeping. That's when it rebuilds the muscle tissue and they just they they need more time for that. Like, you know, they're always looking at their at their recovery time. Mm -hmm. How quick is their recovery time? Mm -hmm. 
from strenuous exercise. So does it enable the growth hormone, the napping, or is that just constant and it just gives it you the does, benefits? It of the does growth? enable the growth hormone. So when we're talking about sleep we or a nap, we're talking about the early stages of the sleep cycle. And it, during that, the, those stages of the sleep cycle, you do get the growth hormone um, released. And for today's audience, I didn't... Um, you know, get my get my list of all the well-being benefits, but there are many, many personal well-being benefits from having a nap. And recent studies have shown um, a, re a reduction in um, stroke and heart attacks and some cancers as well from people who have napped. One of the things I wanted to just sort of mention before when you were talking a bit about some of the problems too in terms of the mm -hmm. sleep, and it's a it's one that's it's not as easy to notice obviously as a mistake that causes an injury or some damage um you know because somebody was too tired or they, they but there is the the difficulty of being ambitious when you're tired and that good ideas that should have been explored mm -hmm. passed away or passed by simply because right now you're too tired to deal with anything more on your plate you're looking at what you've got as a manager already it's mm -hmm. too much i'm tired and so when somebody comes to me with a really good investment opportunity that takes five hours at least to look into you're you're much more inclined to say something quick about why that isn't a good idea yeah it just and i wonder sometimes that just meetings we have in the afternoon mm. i'm going you know i wonder if we just had the same meeting in the morning mm. if everybody would have gone that's a great idea why aren't we doing that why didn't we start that yesterday kind of thing instead of yeah we don't need to do that you know i mean nobody's really asking for it and so on i'm like well by the time the customers are asking for it you guys it kind of means we're not exactly proactive right you know so um anyhow i just thought i'd mention that part Kara, because i don't think people realize that as much as they should the reason i'm painfully aware of it is there's on the way to the airport there's a sea to sky gondola and I had an opportunity to invest in this thing and I was tired when it kind of came my way. And I said something about, oh, I probably won't work. Mm -hmm. that, that parking lot's full every day, Kara. Every day I drive by there going, yeah, that was a good one. Mm -hmm. Called that one, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a bit of a sleeper hot park mm -hmm. pun um, for a lot of people. Anyhow, carry on. I think, well, I think you're right. I think your mind is more closed and you have more of a fixed mindset rather than a growth mindset when you're when you're tired for sure and so i know that um you know i i, I nap pretty much every day but if i've got a, a significant event in the afternoon or a key meeting i doubly make sure that i rest before that meeting because i know that i come to that meeting much more in, engaged, much more receptive, better able to listen, better able to contribute, better able to seize those those new ideas. Exactly. Did you have a nap today, Karen? Before the show, did you have a nap today? What do you think? I actually, so here's a little story. I actually had two naps today. Oh, well. Well, Which that's was, one thing I've got. A double, a double nap, and I'll tell you for why, because um at, over the past three nights um nights one and two i slept really well last night for some reason i actually actually think it was something that i ate um with chilies that kept me awake and i didn't sleep well i really really didn't sleep well and i woke up this morning with a completely thick foggy head and i was coaching a client um at 10 at 10 a.m this morning uk time and I didn't want to reschedule them, but I, I almost felt ill with exhaustion. And I got to the um, parking um, lot before half an hour before the meeting and turned off my engine and I had a nap 
in the car, just as you've described, and it completely um, reset me. So it was absolutely mitigating the uh, effects of my um, bad night's sleep. And I was able to be really present with my clients to really show up. And we did some transformational work. And then I, I had had to actually do a drive today to get to where I am speaking to you from right now. And for me, working at six o'clock in the evening with passion and energy and enthusiasm is not my sweet spot. So absolutely, I thought this is a really important um, conversation and I'm really looking forward to it, but I'm gonna have a, a nap um, before that. So this, this is how I'm showing up late in my day. It's now nearly seven um with the same kind of va va boom that you would normally have got from me if i was presenting in the morning well well thank you i'm like i don't know if you got to see it uh uh care because it's the you you're you're showing slides so i don't know if the chat thing is is available to you but uh, uh a good friend of mine and it's a well we've worked together for a long long time hector uh and I and anyhow, he was saying in the Singapore project he worked at, they implemented a one-hour uh, resting for one hour in the night shift, and um, they uh, they had the same productivity as the day shift with sixty percent of the manpower or something like that. Um, thanks, thanks, Hector. I don't know where you are. I think he's like stuck in uh, um, somewhere in Europe on his way back to Canada. I don't know if you've made it back yet, Hector. But anyhow, thanks for the comment. Um, carry on, Kara. Pardon them. So yeah, we're, we're we're nearly through what I was, um, you know, what we would normally, kind of how we would open the conversation up with companies. Um, so now I'm now I'm talking about the benefits of napping, but I'm I'm going to skip over that because we've already talked about the benefits, and I've told you that there is plenty of scientific evidence for napping, but it's scientific rather than um, the, the kind of workplace studies, unfortunately. Um, are, are few and far between. But this was a really interesting thing I wanted to share with your listeners, is that your employees want to nap. So we did a survey, we called it the big nap, sur nap survey, the end of 2019. So this was before the pandemic. And three quarters of the people that we surveyed told us that they wanted to nap at work. And so this was when the workplaces were opened and where they go was really shocking. So as you said, Larry, going to the car is a common thing to do. 34% of our survey said when they had napped, they went to their car. But a staggering and horrific 23%, nearly 25% of the people we surveyed slept or sneaked off to the loo. And I know in Canada and America, you call it the restroom. Well, <laughs> Well, yeah, it's but, it's, it's, it's interesting part. now, isn't it? How uh, how ironic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the UK, we call the loo the, the WC, the water closet. And so I also write about, you know, it wasn't designed for closet sleepers. Yeah. Um, so. I'm not you know, sure about rest, restroom. I, thi I think it. It, it had to do it or started. I remember when I was a little kid asking my mom about it. She said it had to do with mothers needing a place to feed their babies. Um, but uh, it then kind of carried over as a, a more jaunty term, I guess, than bathroom, toilet, or washroom, or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, that that people are going to the can to sleep is mm -hmm. it, got a lot of issues, especially for the people who just need to go to the can um you know so you, you've got a you've got a certain amount of supply su supply problem here in a way um the uh that's a huge three quarters of the people so uh to, i don't want to interrupt you necessarily care but what is a company like th that's you know so even at the best case scenario your company's 50 percent right like 50 percent of your people if they got a choice would nap if you enabled it so and i don't really think you know you could argue about the benefits but i think you're the only people that would argue about the benefits of napping would be diehard clint eastwood fans or bruce willis or 
superheroes that are Iron Man and stuff like that. And, you know, again, not necessarily being receptive to the physiology that's, you know, not part of Iron Man, whatever. We, we all need, we all have this lull. But yeah. not every, every, a lot of us just think you ride out the lull, that's all. And then, you know, eventually your circadian rhythm comes back. And by about 4.30, instead of feeling like going to sleep, now you feel like going out and playing nine holes of golf or whatever. And so I think it's just, it. I, I don't want to put, you know, my perspective into other people's mouths, but I'll just ride it out, right? And having a coffee is fine. Mm -hmm. But... I don't pretend that I get any great amount of work accomplished during that period. I don't think anybody else really does. Mm -hmm. So we'd probably all be better off to just close our eyes for 20 minutes than go get a cappuccino for sure, right? Yeah, and it doesn't even need to be 20 minutes. I, I know for myself that if I nap for even five minutes, which is more of a micro nap, it can make a difference. So you you know you get you get better at being able to switch off quickly for sure but you certainly don't need any longer than 20 minutes 20 minutes is is really the optimum um time and the a lot of people care a lot of people worry that if it's like it if and maybe you could just clarify this mm -hmm. is they if they sleep longer than 20 minutes or whatever then they feel worse like they wake up okay. feeling like they got woke up in the middle of the night or something. Could you elaborate on that part a bit, like the optimum length and why? Or So it's because of the stages of the sleep cycle. You don't want to go into the deep sleep stage of your sleep cycle. So you either need to nap for 20 minutes, which keeps you in the light stages, but they're very restorative stages of the sleep cycle. Or if you do have the luxury of longer, you need to nap for a whole sleep cycle, which is twenty, which is ninety minutes. Right, so, I need ninety minutes. Ninety minutes. Okay, yes. Yeah. So twenty minutes or ninety minutes, but in between, not so good, right? That's all right. That's correct. And I think earlier you you might have been going down there. Well, if three quarters of the people told us they wanted to nap, where where can they all go? Um, so partly um, we want to. We we've got the the know-how at ProNappers to help companies design and install uh, nap spaces. But you can also buy a lot of standalone, um, what we call nap pods. And I think that there's one that people will be very familiar with, which is the one that looks like um, a kind of a pod where you, you pull a dome over your head. But there are many, many varieties now of different um, what we call nap seals or nap pods. But ultimately, I would like to see um, a culture where if somebody wants to nap, they can just grab a cushion and put it on their desk and put their head on their desk and put on their eye mask. Maybe that eye mask could say something like, I'm recharging my mind, something, some really real positive affirmation. And the other thing is that not everybody is going to nap at the same time. So as I already said, if you've had a really poor night's sleep, you might nap earlier in the day. The typical time is in the mid-afternoon, but people will also nap in the early evening if they know that they've got to um, work late or they're going on a night shift, for example. Okay. Um, I remember, again, working with the railroaders, they were saying that uh, if you did the 20-minute nap, it would likely give you improved vigilance mm -hmm. for another four hours. But then they said that it was a one-time thing. In other words, you couldn't just get another 20-minute nap and then go for another four hours and so on. It was sort of just just sort of, if you will, one emergency uh, recharge. Mm -hmm. that ac is that accurate, Kara? Or yes. can, can you do yeah. more than one? Well, as I said today, it was was un, even unusual for me to, to have two. If you look at the circadian circadian rhythm graphs, and unfortunately, I haven't got them to show people who are looking in, but there is an there is a point in the um, sort of mid afternoon where your this is assuming that you've slept well at night, where your urge and need to sleep collide. So, and then they collide at a much higher level 
before you go to bed. So you have this kind of big sleep in your circadian rhythm and then this mini sleep um, in the middle of the day. So you're you're absolutely right. You you wouldn't nap, go for four hours and nap and go for another four hours. It it doesn't replace the good night's sleep. Kara, could you talk just a bit more for a second about that intersection you just mentioned about when um, you're, you're because my my wife talks sometimes about missing her moment, like to go to sleep, right? Which mm -hmm. is, and if if she doesn't get to sleep, then she doesn't mm -hmm. fall asleep so easily. Whereas I always thought it just kind of got progressively worse, you know, until I started learning more about it. In other words. If you were tired at midnight, you'd be even more tired at one o'clock in the morning and so on. Mm. And like all kinds of young college students, you pull the all-nighter and your circadian rhythm starts to come back and you start feeling awake again. And now that you finally can go to sleep, that the exam's over, that you cram for all night, you can't actually fall asleep because you're at the peak of your circadian rhythm and it's noon. And so... Is, and that's is, is that true though is there is like there there is a like if there is a window if you will and that that's your opportune window for napping and or the big sleep at night so that is would be my personal experience as well the best time to nap in the day is when you feel like you're being overcome with weariness to so to lean into that to go with it and to have your nap then and at night, I completely understand what your wife is saying. So typically people, if they haven't napped in the day, they get to a point in the evening when they're relaxed, they've had a meal, they're watching the television and they fall asleep on the sofa. And that is the point at which anybody next to them who's, who loves them and is kind to them should hoof them up to bed to go to sleep because you'll fall asleep on the sofa and then you'll go upstairs an hour or so later and get into bed and not be able to sleep. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, that I think lots of people fall into that category, right? Mm -hmm. They uh, uh, that that period right there, um, usually about half time in the game, <laughs> um, and you fall asleep and you, you kind of fight. I, I I fight it because I know I won't be able to sleep later on if I do it. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, but back to the, the companies again, Kara, um, they, they can get some pods. Uh, mm -hmm. You can help them with that. Obviously, they're, you know, they're, uh, these are manufactured items, so they're, mm -hmm. they're available in the, the wider, you know, the, the wider market, the, you know, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, any, anything in particular that you don't, you know, just tell people maybe that they should uh, be careful about as they're buying these things or looking at them, any do's and don'ts for that. And then, uh, um, you know, how do they, how do they go about promoting this at the company so that a lot of these stigmas and so on, like, is that part of what you guys do? Do you go in and talk to everybody and kind of help, uh, um, help everybody sort of see where they might have been misaligned or have got some misinformation or quite frankly, you're just dead wrong about it and you need to, you know, smarten up kind of thing. For sure. And I think the, the danger is it's not just as simple as putting in the pods or the reclining chairs because you do need the culture shift of making it an acceptable thing to do. And it's not something that companies are saying to everybody you must now go and nap. They're just saying, if you are that kind of person who recognizes in themselves that you will function better in the afternoons if you close your eyes or function better in the evenings if you close your eyes, they should be allowed to nap. Let your people nap in the same way that you let your people um, go to the gym, um, go to, I'm even gonna say go to the restroom. For, for me, not being allowed to shut my eyes would actually be akin to somebody saying you're not actually allowed to go to the bathroom this afternoon. It's 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 that it's that awful. Well, that is the only time I get to shut my eyes during the whole day. Like when you showed that picture of the guy in the bathroom there. I mean, that's me in India. I mean, like all day long you are on you're presenting on stage, and when you're not on stage, there's people coming up and talking. You don't get a break. 
it's okay. I mean, for those listening, like, it's not like me needing to talk is a real effortful thing for me. You know, I don't have to push myself a lot, but that is the only time I ever get to just take a breath, close my eyes and just relax for a second is why there's nobody else around but that's not to nap that's really just to you know not be on if you will um but so larry the I, one, more like let me, let me just talk about this because one of the things that's a really accessible thing for organizations to start the napping conversation and start nudging the the culture need, needle is through some online content that we've got and it's called Nap School. And Nap School is three 15 minute modules. And the modules are on three topics. So the first topic is on educating people that it is natural and that really the right thing to do to pulse through the day and that we're designed to take periods of rest. So there's this whole piece about napping is natural and normal and then the second um, module is all about the the benefits of napping the um, performance benefits the safety benefits the well-being benefits and how to recognize in yourself when you may need a nap and then the third um, module is all about how to have a really good nap so what can you what do you need to do to nap effectively and that third module also covers how to have the conversations to start shifting the stigma. And so NAP School is a really easy thing that companies can um, load onto their learning management systems and make available to their employees. And it's a way of saying, to, saying um, we recognize that this could be a really um, effective uh, tool for your resilience and your performance and you know we're behind this so if anybody's out there that would like to know more about nap school i know that you're going to be uh sharing my details yeah and actually, I, at the end yeah, of my 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 how long, um, how long does it take just tell us how long the modules take care of. i mean i won't um you know in terms of pricing and things like that they can get that stuff from you obviously um mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Kara Moore at pronappers.co.uk? Yeah, .co.uk. Okay. So the modules are 15 minutes each, so three modules, so a maximum of 45 minutes, and they're very interactive, they're very engaging, they've got graphics, they've got um, some YouTube clips. Um, they're, they're, they're fun and informative and educative. And in fact, Larry, um, I know that people listening in won't be able to see this, but this screenshot I've got here of some uh, some screenshots from Nap School, the one on the bottom left actually shows you that um, circadian rhythm graph. Right. So it shows you where the arrow is pointing is where your um, nap is, and then the point at the, where the, um, the, 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 the two lines, the need to sleep and the urge to sleep collide, further on is your nighttime sleep. So you know, the, this uh, nap school is full of the science, the, the history of napping, and it, it, so, so it's the facts as well as the how to, and we haven't yet talked about the, the how to have a good nap, but maybe over to you, but maybe we may want to see what the audience um, really want to know and check in with the questions. Well, yeah, I mean, I've been I've been trying to keep sort of tabs on the on the chat, Kara. Uh, it's and, and and look at you, and I can't do both at the same time. So sorry for uh, potentially not being as engaged. But um, the um, I, I think we some of the questions that are uh, um, I know that people have. First of all, you've answered it's okay to have more than one nap. Typically, the, the time is when you feel you need it. Um, do a lot of people, though, does that become like a habit? Like, in other words, at 2.45 in the afternoon at 3 o'clock is, is almost always when I will feel this urge to close my eyes. And, like, do you eventually develop a habit, a condition, like, as you do, like, you get hungry at lunchtime kind of thing? Is it a habit? 
Um, so my personal experience is that I want to nap five, at least five times a week. But other people who I talk to say, actually, there's only just one or two days a week when they want to nap. So okay. it hasn't become a regular habit for them. And there are just some days for them when that kind of urge to nap is very strong. Okay, interesting. Okay, so even even with uh, yourself, it's not every it's it's not necessarily every every day. Okay, that's that's I wouldn't have thought that. Okay, interesting. Um, but by and large, like if you feel like you should close your eyes if you're not driving the car or walking, you know, moving. Obviously, that's what you should try to do is is mm -hmm. close your eyes is, mm -hmm. and, and maybe and maybe set an alarm so you wake up in 20 minutes for sure. I know that's my son's big, you know, worry is if I close my eyes, I won't wake up in time and I'll miss whatever it is. Um, are thinking or meditation skills required to have a good nap? This was, um, this is one of the questions I got from about eight, uh, 23 to 26 year olds, uh, last night that were over at, over at the house. So, uh, I thought I'd just ask them if they had any questions about napping. All eight of them had questions. All of them were interested, and they're all, you know, just recent university graduates, full of, you know, if you will, vim and vim and vigor. And all of them were like, you know, how many, how often, longer than twenty minutes is just closing your eyes and lying down. Is that just as good? Um, and what are the tips for falling asleep for a nap? Uh, any any of uh, the best ticks, tricks or techniques. Um, so any of those questions, Kara, if you wanted to take a shot at uh, more than one's okay, if you said yeah. 20 minutes max. 20 it minutes max. So there's a question there on the screen I can see, which is I tend to be grumpy after a nap. Is there anything I can do about that? And the question to that is just to keep your nap to a 20 minute maximum. I bet that the person asking that question will be napping for maybe 30, 40 minutes, and then you're gonna wake up grumpy. So to answer your questions, um, Larry, of those young people, you don't need to be good at meditation or breathing. You don't need to be an expert at anything to nap. It is a way of drifting off into your nap is to do some deep breathing, but it's not scientific breathing. It's just kind of slow your breathing down as a signal to your body that you are slowing down. Um, you don't need to listen to... Um, what what about the breathe, the breathe yourself to sleep, people? Like the seven deep breaths and the counting yeah. to seven and the, yeah. the bird cage thing with the diaphragm and all that sort of stuff, Kara, is that all important for this? So different people will have different ways of drifting off. So that would, that, that four, seven, eight breathing I think you're describing is certainly a way of um, helping right. you go for a nap. Four out for seven, you're right, yes. The Another way is that at ProNap, as we have actually developed two nap meditations. Um, so they're guided meditations that where you, um, you listen to them and it starts with just a really positive message, reinforcing that you're doing the best thing for your body and your mind and your productivity to have the nap. So there's the kind of positive affirmations and then it, it helped the, the voice and the words help you drift off and they're timed to wake you up after 20 minutes. So that kind of thing can help or um, the other thing that's really good for helping you drift off is, is smell. And a product we've developed at ProNappers is a nap aroma inhaler which um, looks like a nasal stick and it's a blend of three specific carefully chosen oils two designed to help um, relax and quieten and calm your mind and one of the oils is what we call a kicker oil so that you awake magically after 20 minutes um, rejuvenated and raring to go so for me um, if i'm having a nap and i'm having a full 20 minutes nap the my go-to um, tools, if you like, would be my eye mask if it's light and my nap inhaler. 
both of which I could just have tucked in my handbag. Where I nap is less important to me because I can get myself into a comfortable position. And if you ask the army, for example, you know, they, they're, they're taught and trained to nap any place, anywhere. You know, they don't roll out the reclining chairs for the, for the army and say, okay, go and, go and snuggle, go and get comfy and then nap. So for some people that comfort is important, but actually you don't want to get too comfy. So I would really advise against, if you're napping at home, going into your bedroom and getting under the duvet and getting too cozy. Um, Interesting. That, okay. that, that, because you're really leaning into that point that your wife talks about when you just feel like, oh, God, all I really want to do is shut my eyes. When you get that feeling, you will, um, and you give yourself the permission to nap, you don't won't have any trouble drifting off in my experience. Interesting. Okay, so it's best probably not to be in like the full prone sleep comfy bed position where you sleep for hopefully the seven eight hours it's mm. it's better to be maybe in like you see like i was i thought that was interesting with those pods that you showed us that very few of them were full you know full flat recline mm. they, they tend to be more like the the lazy boy chair kind of thing like the mm. arm chair, like the recliner chair mm. so is that is that probably like that recliner chair probably close to the what you're looking for if you will in terms of a a, a, a nap aid absolutely yeah because that that wouldn't be for you know for a lot of companies that might be easier i don't know whether or not uh, you know I, I don't know what the price of the pods is compared to the price of the uh of the recliner chairs but uh you know the one question I want to make sure I ask you, Kara, about a company, if it was the company listening or, or a safety representative from a company who was listening, um, if, if they're in North America or outside of the UK, mm -hmm. uh, can you can you still help them? I mean, like how, how much of what you do is, mm -hmm. is, is about you going in there and talking to the employees and the managers or can you do that virtually now or can they just quite frankly, get your uh, your online course and uh, um, sort of implement it at their own company. Um, tell us about the options, if you will. Yeah, so the pandemic has really helped um, change how people's um, acceptability of virtual webinars and workshops to be seen as a very effective way of delivering um, information so we can run our workshops and our, and run webinars virtually but the the nap really the nap school would be a very good way of um, for individuals to get on board with the whole nap agenda and then the what we would do with a company is if they is help them kind of with a with a launch um, of with the, with the materials to um, kind of publicize that um, napping is, is, is now something that we are going to be including within our, or accepting um, napping is something we're going to be including within our well-being, performance and safety um, provision. Okay, so just in another Another big picture question, just so that folks can kind of go away with at, le at least an idea. Say, say for instance, I was a uh, uh, a manager. Three hundred people at my plant were running uh, twelve hour, twelve twelve hour shifts. We 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 change we change from days to night every twenty eight days, and we might have three different shifts working on the weekend. The, the weekend two days as well as the obviously the the day office people type of thing and i we're not doing anything at all now for napping and we don't have any napping facilities that i can just commandeer if you will so we, we we've got to go buy whatever we need to buy and we need to mm -hmm. we need to get whatever training we need 
to get. What, like, what's that gonna like say for if you had 300 people, I'm just saying 100 on each shift or something for easy math. How, how much of a price tag is a company looking at for, for something like that, Kara? I mean, is it a million dollars? Is it, I can't imagine it's a hundred dollars, but um, you know, part of it is like, you, you know, we gotta be realistic. These folks, you know, have to know whether, you know, I'm asking for a Toyota or whether I'm asking for a BMW and. So the, the, um, the, the nap pods by um, Met, um, Metro Naps, they're retailing at about uh, 10,000 pounds UK, UK pounds. But obviously the reclining chairs become a lot less and you could even have bean bags which cost significantly less and the good thing about creating a place to nap is you can take a room which might be um, underutilized um, it could be a room that doesn't have particularly good natural light and very easily convert a space that you're not currently using because it's not the kind of optimal workspace into what i would call a quiet room or a serenity room so it doesn't require, um, you know, mil millions of pounds to introduce the napping um, culture. And my last, uh, um, possibly, I'm um, 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 kind of getting, I'm um, getting near the end of my um, clear thinking. Um, is that already a lot of companies have refitted out their um, restaurant areas with with a sort of comfy chairs kind of what I would call breakout areas and when I pre-pandemic when I was going into companies I would see these breakout chairs and breakout areas with these uh, comfy chairs and I would have felt quite comfortable just going and sitting in one of those chairs with my eye mask on and closing my eyes for 15 minutes okay and and cost you know per uh, you know, per person and things like that is, uh, again, you know, I, I guess, well, just it's easier maybe, um, Mike, if you could put her uh, her email up there and they can, you know, because it depends on how many people probably and all the rest of uh, stuff. So there's... Um, so the NAP school is available on a license and we have different price points depending on how many people are going to be having access to NAP school. Right, that, that's what I kind of thought, Kara. So we'll, we'll let them contact you, and they can get all of get all of those details. Um, this is uh, for anybody listening right now. If you've got a question, um, you can always ask the question either to me, Larry at SafeStart.com, or, or to Kara um, at Pronappers.co.uk, I believe it is. Um, yes. Yes. Cara, um, right. list people listening in rather than viewing. It's Cara, C A R A dot more, M O O R E, at Pronappers, which is P R O N A P P E R S dot co dot UK. But if you've got a question, right now is the time to ask it if you want to get it answered on this show. Mm -hmm. um, and just if I can, then I'll, I'll try to. Uh, so many things to summarize, Kara, and then just chime in if you miss. But um, twenty, the 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 idea of powering down versus powering through, and to me, you know that 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 makes a that makes a lot of sense. I don't think anybody would really argue about the performance aspects, the safety aspects, especially in terms of slower reflexes, and decision making. Um, it's almost to the point where you know you you'll hear people I was tired as as if that's a reasonable excuse it, it's so very common that it's accepted but like that you know that, that you get tired is is kind of something you've also got to manage right you know you got, you got to manage your sugar levels and other things too it's, it's you know there's there, you there's see, a bit of, you need to be able to you need to manage your your fatigue levels in the same way that you manage your hunger levels because you will know about that term hanger you know when you're so hungry it turns into kind of that hanger that anger and to say to somebody oh gosh well i was you know i was i was hungry i hadn't eaten that would be unacceptable 
because we expect people to um, have, you know, give themselves enough um, food and drink and snacks through the day so that they they don't to manage that, that hunger. And we should do the same for sleep so that it's not acceptable for someone to say, well, I was overtired. I was if if they had the space and the permission to go and shut their eyes and it doesn't take any longer than going to make a cup of coffee, walking to the kitchen, making a cup of coffee, um, waiting for the coffee to cool down and drinking it. You can have a nap um, in the same amount of time. Well, I, I think though the idea that you need to, I, I don't know if you can make people responsible for the being tired in the first place, even if you enable all the napping strategies and so on, because just like what you said, you didn't sleep well last night for no good reason, right? But I do think you can hold people responsible for being able to recognize when you're tired and to need to postpone an important decision until you're fit or, you know, just like you wouldn't decide something, you know, I mean, you might decide to get mad when you were drunk out of your mind, but I think most of us would caution you against it. And to the same extent, you know, you shouldn't be making big, important decisions when you're tired. The thing I was trying to illuminate a bit is that saying no to something can also be a big decision. What I should have said is not right now, let me come back to this when I'm feeling rested and I can look at it with a fresh set of eyes and and make a good objective decision about this. You know, it's a quarter of a million dollars. It's not something I want to be too quick about, right? You know, but I that, 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 there that, is that, definitely some truth behind the saying, let me sleep on it. Well, yes, but that's also because it, it really helps the back part of your brain which can't talk, give your front part of your brain a feeling. So in the morning, you actually wake up going, you know, I think I should marry this girl. But um, that's um, the part The part that I think is important there is that it. I don't think the benefits of sleeping are, are difficult. I think the stigmas and, you know, you look at it, it we, we created the stigma with the kindergarten nap. I mean, you can imagine if you're a kindergarten teacher, you know, these kids just all get horrifically cranky and you can't teach them anything in the afternoon. It's just about the same as what we do, by the way, you know, like I don't try to keep going in the afternoon the same way we go in the morning. It's much more interactive and, and so on. But because we did this with the kindergarten kids, it's it's like if you're going to be the fearless leader ceo you don't really want people worried about you sneaking down to the car with your little blankie you know like linus or something so i i think probably it isn't the benefits it's the stigmas that are the big barriers um are there less barriers in europe and in the uk than there are in north america from what you've seen Kara? um well certainly you know spain's got the siesta but the big, the big um, advocate place that um, napping is acceptable is over in the east. Really? So, okay. So in China, for example. But I need to be very careful here because sometimes um, the, the, the cultural acceptability of napping in China and Japan is associated with getting people to work excessively long hours. Right. And, and we are definitely not championing the nap so that you can push your people to work excessively long hours. But what I do think we need to acknowledge is the very, you know, the reality of how people work. And people are do work long hours and they are switched on digitally for a long time. And we are working across time zones. We do, many people do have international teams and so we're no longer working the kind of the traditional old fashioned nine to five with an hour for lunch. Technology has extended the working day. The pandemic has meant the boundaries between work and home are 
even more blurred than before. And ena enabling people to have a nap in the middle of the day helps them with their effectiveness in the afternoons, for sure. It, it helps them with their mood. It helps them with their physical well-being, with their mental well-being. To, to me, it's an, it's, it is the productivity and safety and um, tool that is hiding in plain sight. And I think it is the next big thing that's going to happen. It is the, it is the nap revolution. I want to see people being able to shut their eyes if they want to in the working day to become as acceptable as someone saying, I'm going for a run. Well, it, it is in some, you know, you see somebody putting their eye shades on the middle of the afternoon on an airplane to get a nap. It is perfectly normal. You don't think a thing of it. But if you walk down the aisle at most office buildings, your cubicle things, you know, and you saw somebody doing that, it would seem odd. And yet there's really no difference between the two other than, you know, the one guy's napping because he doesn't feel like watching the movie that they're playing or whatever it is. And the other person or didn't want to read a book or a magazine, but the other person's at work. Right. So um, what if you were a safety professional, Kara, that wanted to do something at his or her company, um, what would be the you? What would you say your first step, second? Like in other words, here's what I do first and second, and so on. Um, like you know, the, other than maybe contact me, and I, but well, I think we need within the companies we need joined up thinking. So it's for the safety um, managers to be talking to the wellness managers to be talking to the quality managers. Well, quite and often this, they're the same person, so they could, they could have these conversations with themselves. There might be a quality manager. It's usually not a wellness manager in North America per se, like as a title. Well, well, yeah, in the UK we would call it um, uh, head of well-being. Okay. How about human resources? It, it falls within that, but it's different. It's the person. That, there is so much more um, recognition about the importance of um, mental health and physical health and energy management. Right. Yeah, we, we don't, but that's not that that that's not commonplace here. That would be that would be much more of an exception. Um, so you're. Go back to the health and safety professional, mm -hmm. they, and they're likely going to be working with the human resources uh, on this a bit. Would it, obviously a union if they had a union to, to to work and help and support with this as well. Anything mm -hmm. anything else like is there a, a, an introductory session that you you put on webinar for companies care that they could uh, just sort of get a few more people interest like is it's. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to champion something all by yourself. If you could yeah. get 10 or 20 other people to watch the webinar, you'll probably find you've got some other people who desperately need to nap in that group of 10 or 20. You so might in, in that webinar, we we do a, a, an interactive test at the beginning where we have we we um, straw poll people's attitudes to napping. And then we feed them the information and then we straw poll, where has their attitude to napping changed? So we can see within the webinar whether people who are a bit skeptical about it after the webinar are thinking, this is now something that I will have a go. And we also have different um, workshops or webinars for um, the, the team managers, for the well-being or the health officers, um, and for the um, for the, for the senior management, for the board level, where we're talking to them much more about the kind of strategic importance of introducing a culture where napping is both acceptable and accessible. Well, I, I know that most of the folks watching might not believe this, but that was not orchestrated or staged, that brilliant segue into the next show in two weeks 
which is the role of the EHS professional in corporate governance. It will be with Bob Arnold, he's from the UK, um, and Dr. Wada Ghanem. They've just uh, released a new book uh, on all of this. But I, I met these two gentlemen. They were they both got more degrees and credentials and initials after their name than you can think of. And I was drearing their session because normally these academics are really boring. And what they put on basically was how effective you can be as an EHS professional in helping with the direction at the board of directors level and even with the C-suite level in terms of providing the resources and, and everything else that you need at the company. So it's going to be a really, a really interesting show. They're not going to get into the whole depth of the book for us, but certainly, uh, certainly the highlights, but both, both, both gentlemen I found were just riveting speakers. So uh, hopefully you can, you can all tune in in a couple of weeks. Um, same time. Um, Kara, thank you very, very much for being on the show. Um, personally, like I said, I, I, I had a lot of my own skepticism kind of overcome by David Hughes, but, but also just a bit with the last night with the, the eight 24 year olds and how interested they all were. Um, I think there's a lot of potential here for companies to get a lot more out of their employees and, and everybody wins. Everybody's just happier and healthier in the end. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I say all the time is you can tell me whatever you want, but every time you make a mistake, little or big, it frustrates you and it wastes time. And how many of those mistakes are caused by fatigue is huge for most of us. Mm -hmm. And in my own personal case, I've made more mistakes because of rushing than fatigue. But the biggest mistakes I've made have been because of fatigue, like the falling asleep at the wheel and nearly killing myself. So I think, I, I think Kara, um, for a lot of, I think you're right that napping's come of age, if you will. Um, and uh, I encourage all of you out there to, uh, to get a hold of Kara and, uh, and at least see if you could get that initial webinar for uh, some of your stakeholders and see, see just like you, how many folks out there really would appreciate the opportunity and the ability to be able to nap if they got a chance. Kara, any, any, any last comments or last words for all of us? You've said it, Larry. The, the best way to shift the stigma is people to start talking about the, the benefits of napping. So you were personally um, affected by David Hughes saying the difference. Don't tell David that he's going to, you know, he's going to like. And the, young, and, the young, and the young people. So we need more people in companies who are the closet nappers to come forward and talk about their superpower being the nap. So whether it's the, at whatever level you are in the company, if you nap currently behind closed doors, share your nap story share the difference that having a nap makes for you because that is the the best noise that can help nudge the needle towards making um napping acceptable yeah I, I think i think the first step is to really just get get you to do the webinar for their stakeholders and quite frankly see for yourself whether there's an elephant in the living room or whether there isn't and I think you're going to find that there's been an elephant there for a long, long time, everybody. And um, it isn't just for the shift workers or the graveyard shift workers. It's everybody. So, um, Kara, again, thank you very much. Um, everybody that's tuning in, again, thanks very much. Um, do, do feel free or please share this uh, with with the other folks and your, your, your LinkedIn contacts or, uh, or the folks at your company. Uh, the podcast will be made available um, probably within about seven or ten days, uh, depending on, uh, on how how long it takes Mike to sort of to sort of edit it. And thanks very much, everybody, for tuning in, Hector. Um, I hopefully you make it out of Belgrade and get uh, get back to Canada. Give me a shout as soon as you do. And again, Kara, thanks very much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it too.
Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.